The painting is an example of inexhaustible contrast in art. And I, I try to describe this idea of inexhaustible contrast as when you take an image, an artwork, to a point where it is holding a set of associations and ideas and meanings um, in, in a certain relationship to each other, but there's a tension between them. So that as soon as you think you have a, a handle on what the artwork is about, something else comes to mind or you notice something else and suddenly you realize there's much more to the painting. And so you then dive back into it once you come up with kind of a, a, a new understanding, yet again, something else pops up that kind of evades your ability to completely define it. And that's what I mean by inexhaustible contrast. Picasso's use of space in this artwork is central to this idea of inexhaustible contrast, this quality of inexhaustible contrast. Picasso is jamming ideas up against each other, redefining beauty, desire, redefining conventions of space. We see front against back, jagged versus rounded, style against style. He refers to, he draws on, but then he transcends the past. There's also in the background here a rivalry with another artist, an older artist, Matisse, with whom Picasso was in a competition for uh, kind of a leadership of the modern art movement of the time in Paris. In fact, Matisse was particularly upset with this uh, painting. He thought that um, Picasso was making fun of him in it. No one had produced anything like it before, but even though some people kind of felt horrified by it, it still was a compelling image. One person said it was like drinking petrol to spit fire. When people are having those kind of reactions to your artwork, you know you're on to something. So what is happening in this space of inexhaustible contrast? Picasso is rethinking ideas about philosophy and sexuality, the nature of physical space, the relationship of art to reality, um, what is appropriate content or even recognizable content for art. Let's take some of these ideas uh, one by one. With each of these ideas serving Picasso's overall agenda, which was how do you break away from realism, from naturalism? How do you get beyond this idea that a picture is like looking through a window and that the function of art was to refer to what is real, either something real that we can see around us or the reality perhaps of heaven or some religious idea. So Picasso is looking for a way of breaking from realism. First, he is challenging the idea of what is appropriate or recognizable content for the work of art. This is a highly sexualized, erotic image, and he's um, foregrounding a kind of narcissistic male desire, this inner sexual life, in such a raw way, which would not have been considered socially acceptable. He's stripping away romantic Victorian concepts of love and sexuality and reducing them to a kind of animal sexuality. And he's doing this by rethinking certain strains of philosophy. First, this idea of the noble savage. We see that two of the figures, two of the figures standing up on either side of the image have faces influenced by the sculpture of the Iberian Peninsula. And the seated figure has a, a face influenced by African sculpture. For hundreds of years, there was this idea in European thought that um, it was civilization that was a corrupting influence. But if we could get back to the state of nature, the state of being a noble savage, we could find kind of our uh, true selves. Picasso is calling this into question, this idea of the noble savage into question. 
He's also challenging the idea that the world is only one way, that there is only one real reality, but rather there are a multiplicity of realities experienced by many different people. And he's doing this in a space which, of course, is very flat. It's not a linear perspective space. And remember, the genesis of um, linear perspective had a lot of religious ideas associated with it, where uh, linear perspective was seen as evidence of the Christian's God's plan for the universe. Along with that, there's a, a denial that nature and physical space can be measured by one yardstick or by one standard way of viewing things. And instead, there's this conception of space and time as kind of happening all at once, no point of which has primacy or more importance over any other point. So he's also questioning the relationship of art and reality so that art is no longer pointing to um, a real reality, but instead the artwork constitutes its own unique existence, having its multiple possible relationships to multiple ideas. So in questioning hierarchies of logic and value, in questioning ideas of philosophy and religion and sexuality, the nature of physical reality, and what is appropriate content and recognizable content for art, um, he needed a new space. It would be difficult to ask these questions, to address these questions within the space of linear perspective. Are we noble savages or are we sexualized animals? Is there one superior primary way of looking at the world where we can get a handle on the real reality? Or is reality a multiplicity, something that we can't get a handle on simply from one perspective? Is the unfiltered content of our inner psychological lives our inner sexual desires and neuroses, appropriate content for art. Does art have to refer to something outside of itself in order to be meaningful? The figure in the lower right-hand quadrant, the uh, figure with the head that looks like an African mask, is a good example of how he fuses multiple ideas and associations uh, into a single image. So here we see a figure um, that is contorted and twisted, um, the head twisted backwards, and the head is uh, from an African mask. The head and the body together stir associations of, of quote-unquote raw sexuality. Historically, Europeans saw quote-unquote, primitives as being less civilized and more sexual than supposedly civilized Europeans. So we have this image of this supposedly primitive individual that is highly sexualized, and yet it is a Caucasian body. So in this space of inexhaustible contrast, just looking at the lower right quadrant of the painting, in this one figure, we have the kind of unveiling of uh, Western hypocritical racism where Europeans see themselves as somehow superior, yet at the same time they're enchanted with the exoticism of other cultures, especially cultures that they regard as more primitive. And yet how primitive can this figure be? if it's powerful enough to confront us with our own twisted Victorian era fetishes that still are kind of with us. We still see in European and American culture this fascination with quote-unquote exotic cultures, Uh, whether this be Japanese manga culture or grafting on the mythologies of other cultures Uh, into our own lives in an attempt to make meaning. So as soon as we think we might have a handle on even one of these figures, in this case, the one in the lower right-hand quadrant, 
we find that there's not one interpretation that is adequate, but that it's a whole constellation of ideas kind of floating around each other. Pete Seeger once said that um, truth is like a rabbit in a bramble bush. You know it's kind of in there. You know the rabbit is kind of in the bramble bush, but because it blends in so well, you can never quite tell exactly where it is at any one point. Um, it's a good example, a good metaphor for understanding this notion of inexhaustible contrast. We know there's a certain kind of meaning or a set of meanings in here somewhere, but we're never sure exactly where they are because as soon as we point to one thing, something else pops up. Another reason for this quality of inexhaustible contrast in this image is that um, if you notice, it's not a narrative picture. There's not a, a story happening here. We're being presented with an image that we have to confront rather than a story that we can tell to ourselves. However, this was not the case um, when Picasso started working on this image. I mentioned that there are hundreds, maybe seven or eight hundred preparatory sketches uh, for this image. And when we look at those preparatory images, we discover that at first, Picasso conceived this image very much like a narrative painting. So now let's take a look at how this painting came about. Let's look at some of those preparatory sketches and some of Picasso's sources. So here is one of Picasso's preparatory sketches. We see immediately that there are two additional figures, um, two men. Uh, in the center, we have um, a male sailor, and on the left-hand side, we have a medical student. So originally, the composition was more crowded, and it was telling a story. Here, as I've mentioned, uh, going to the brothel and spending time with prostitutes or sex workers was an everyday occurrence or a common occurrence for many people, but uh, there was an associated risk with this practice syphilis and other sexually transmitted diseases, but especially syphilis. It couldn't be treated. It could result in death if you got it. And Picasso had a mortal fear of contracting syphilis even as he uh, frequented uh, the brothels. 